Welcome. Namaste. I'm Red Feather. Thank you for tuning in to this video. Um, I'm thankful to the Law of Attraction and I'm grateful that you allowed yourself to listen to your intuition and guiding you to it. This is the way the Law of Attraction works. Like attracts like. Now what is this video? What is it going to be about? Why should you stay tuned? Well, it's going to be a brief introduction into theosophy from the work of Annie Besant entitled The Ancient Wisdom. But I want to preface this with a new report by some psychologist named Fish, uh, Fishbach, and I just heard this on NPR not too long ago as I was scrolling through my radio stessions this morning before I finally settled with the classical music, as I always do. And <clears throat> there was a brief story about humans and our motivations and how what we perceive gives us more motivation is actually not what gives us our motivation. If you were, they, they conducted several experiments and they, they found that mystery or the element of chance actually increases the work effort that someone will put into a given activity. Now, let me explain. So, they offer people two dollars to drink a very large amount of water. If they were able to drink the water, they would get the two dollars. Or, in the opposite case, they offered the people um, one or two dollars, depending on the flip of a coin, if they were able to drink all the water. And the group that had the element of chance between the one and two dollars actually drank more or worked harder than the group that knew they were going to earn two dollars if they drank the water. <clears throat> Furthermore, the, the study suggested that the element of not knowing actually increases our excitement, if you will. Um, and I, I consider it to be hope, the pursuit of happiness. All the philosophers have known this for time eternal. Francis Bacon states it very eloquently in, in his book, The Wisdom of the Ancients, which I'll get into you with some as well. I want to go over the entire um, chapter on Pan and the God of Nature, which is truly profound. I think he foreshadows beautifully that with the sciences that we have in modern times of probability, quantum mechanics, cybernetics. Bacon was a true Illuminati, Rosicrucian. Now, what is theosophy? And why did I mention that, that story? It's because it's mystery. You see, in chance, God plays dice. Plato tells us, I believe it's in the symposium, that Thoth, the Egyptian god for numbers, and um, the word, literally, thought, logos, represented by the ibis-headed man holding the, the phoenix staff for resurrection and the ankh for eternal life, the ankh's a symbol for the mystery substance that taken into the body transmutes the spirit and allows for ecstasis or ecstasy to occur and then a union with God work quote unquote in theogenic experience. And what I mean in lay terms is taking a magic mushroom, traveling out of your body, expanding your consciousness to its fully, um, well, as fully as you can possibly perceive it I suppose, and then bringing it back in again. There's different mysteries they are not all the same between ayahuasca Syrian rue, morning glory seeds, gypsum weed, Amanita muscaria mushroom, psilocybin cubensis mushroom, delisergic acid, ergot, I believe dry banana peels, the roots from sweet potatoes, basically plants of all different types, you know, cannabis, obviously hashish in the purified form is a very powerful hallucinogen if you eat enough of it. Their plants in nature in general are designed to aid us. It's like a, a key going in a, a, a hole and you turn it and open the door. It's exactly what taking these plants do for you. They open the, they, they dial the code to the stargate and open the portal for you to step through. 
philosophy is a key that gets gets you through a lot of doors as well. That gets you to the the door that will allow you the entheogenic experience. Now, theosophy. Annie Besant, who published this book at the turn of the last century, tells us in the introduction that the unity underlying all religions. Now, I want to preface this too, that mystery and the mysteries were what the ancients practiced or worshipped. Their, their religions were called the mystery religions, pagans, because I believe they understood the underlying and fundamental nature of chance or chaos in the universe. So we've been living under a false light that there is order, and in fact, order is not the norm, it is the byproduct, it is the birth child out of chaos. Chaos is the egg that the chicken came from and will ultimately go back into, again, sameness. Entropy tells us this, and what is the sameness, but the seed. All things ultimately revolve around the seed. They come out of the seed, they grow to fruition, they die, they fall, they degenerate, they're diluted, they're reintegrated into the seed to be regrown. <clears throat> it's an Ouroboros eating its own tail. The nutrients from the dead leaves provide the seed bed for the, the yearling seed to grow in the spring. It's a never-ending cycle eternal, without beginning and without end. And if I may, just to allow you to know how long plants and advanced plants have been alive on the face of the earth, I was reading um, about, well, theories for the origin of the moon, and I read this paper presented to NASA in Astrophysics published in 1968. And it had a very interesting fact that scientists at that time understood and knew that plants complex plants on land had existed for at least 3.2 to 3.8 billion years on earth because they found a fig tree, now mind you, a fossil of a fig tree that had been um, what we call overlaid or interrupted by a magma flow and they dated this based on um, atomic uh, dating. I believe it was detritium or something at the time but 3.8 billion years ago roughly, or 3.2, and not that, you know, at that, that distance, it, it's, a, it's a long time. If it is even 3.2 billion years, that means that fig trees, which are common around us still today, and the, the fruit, the fig, <laughs> the fig itself, has existed at least that long. That's a very complex organism. You know, it may seem like it's not, but the tree is extremely complex. It stores within it a consciousness, a record of the entire cosmos. I believe the trees are part of a whole system that span throughout the entire cosmos of our galaxy at a minimum, perhaps the rest of the galaxies, and they spread throughout all the stars that have somewhere around them, every star, depending on how large or small it is, has to have some Goldilocks zone, you would think, where material that didn't you know, collect during the formation of the star, congealed, accreted into planets, just like our solar system. So every star that you see in the sky likely has some sort of planetary bodies or, um, you know, you, you could say um, planetoids or minor planets or whatever they classified Pluto is, uh, protoplanets around these, these stars. And if they're in the right location where they're far enough away it's, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, you know, the conditions are kind of kind of appropriate, the, the planet has some geologic activity, it's got an active core and a magnetic field, I think some serious things can happen and pff, life can, can bloom and blossom. I believe that given the, the universe as we understand it has existed for at least you know, 13 or 14 billion years, it's a long time for life of a very advanced type to have developed and figured out a way 
if you will, spread itself throughout the entire cosmos. And to do this efficiently, like a von Neumann probe, and von Neumann came up with the theory of gains that revolutionized modern economics and social theory. I'm a poker player, just like God. The game of chance. You, know, you understand the probabilities and it's an incentive if you if you think uh, that you have good luck. You know, just the idea of chance. What could happen? I could get the better outcome or I could get the worst. Because that's honestly how life really is. See, life doesn't give us any guaranteed outcome. Nothing is guaranteed because we have this kind of unknown hanging over our head at the end called death. And it's not guaranteed. We don't know what's going to happen uh, unless you're a shaman like myself and you've died a number of times and you can take people on the journey and show them. But still, objectively, do I ultimately know? Who knows? You know, it's all just a ride according to Bill Hicks. <coughs> the ancient mystery wisdom was that. Taking the ride, what the ride meant, that this is all a ride, an experience that you're creating. Literally, each step that you take, each word that you make, is active participation in co-creation. Because we are all, each and every one of us, individual little nodes or eyes in the mind, constituents, atoms, monads in the cosmos, or chaos, chaosomos, that is the all, that is God, if you will, the, the all, the Tao, the light and the dark, the, you know, the chaos and the order, they exist co-equally. The observer has to be from the field of possibility in order to observe what is possible. It's a reciprocal process. So out of nothing came something. This is the ancient wisdom that all the world's religions were founded upon, founded off of, and have grown in a diversified manner over the last 10, 15,000 years since the great floods and cataclysms that ended the reign of the last Empire, the Atlanteans and the Murians. And it's taken us a, a, a bit of a, of a while to restart, but you know it's it's only a blink of an eye when you you consider that 3.2 billion year time frame that fig trees have been here. And then, okay, if you want to take modern science at face value and anthropology, very recently. A hominid fossil was discovered in Ethiopia, in Africa, in the, the Rift Valley, very near where the original one was discovered by, I believe, Louis Leakey named Lucy. Um, she was an Australopithecus that was roughly, I believe, 3.2 million years old, one of our oldest, or supposedly our oldest known ancestor on the Homo line. But she was not actually Homo, she was an uh, Australopithecus. The Homo line, they found an ancestor going back, I believe, 2.8 million years. And that is an upright, walking, likely talking, grunting, gesticulating, pointing, signing, large-brained mammal with teeth and everything else exactly like anatomically modern Homo sapiens sapiens. The only thing different between them and us is degree. And that degree is refinement of consciousness. That's what things are doing, refining consciousness. There was a consciousness that I began talking about originally, the tree. It's part of the whole system of the cosmos that is a von Neumann probe. And the tree can't exist without fungi or bacteria. And if you look at DNA analysis, the root, the most ancient, the most primitive of all DNA structure on the planet is fungi and bacteria. Now furthermore, fungi and bacteria are capable of surviving in conditions inhospitable to any other life. In radioactive environments in outer space. Space shuttles go up into outer space and come back with all sorts of wild bacteria. Bacteria that eats metal, for crying out loud. 
Yeah, wild stuff. And furthermore, bacteria is the smallest known form of life or fungi, down to like 0 .0009 um, microns or something. This is just released. Very incredibly tiny. Now, that tiny particle, if cast into outer space, can travel on what is known as a photon wave, which is basically the waves of light traveling outward from all directions and from all the stars at nearly the speed of light. And ultimately, it would end up hitting whatever the light did. If it hits a planetary body, the fungal spore would land on the planetary body. These are von Neumann probes. Von Neumann, the theory of uh, man who invented game theory, came up with the theory of von Neumann probes also, which is a self-replicating organism or machine that's sent out to find a potential place that is going to be hospitable for life to be seeded and evolve. I believe the fungi, the mushrooms, are that. They're connected with all life in the oceans and on land. Bacteria plays a crucial role, a symbiotic role. Trees cannot uptake minerals without the mycelium or the mushroom's body on the tree roots. Coral reef cannot photosynthesize without zooxanthella, which is a bacteria that's grown from whale poop and the coral reef takes it in and then the bacteria photosynthesizes and thus the, the reefs have life. So without the fungi there is no life on this planet. And anyone who's ever taken one, uh, to use the words of Terrence McKenna, will know sure as, as the day is long that if we're really interested in, in communicating with quote unquote extraterrestrial intelligences, the mission or the search for ET, SETI, in Ari Saibo, where they have the giant antennas looking up into you know, space for radio signals, that they should probably begin much more terrestrial in origin and looking underneath that satellite where all the cows grow and there happened to be a ubiquitous amount of psilocybin cubensis mushrooms growing on the holy cow shit. The holy shit? Yeah. Mushrooms. Cows have been worshipped in India for thousands of years because they're holy, because in their poop grows the sacred fruit body of the divine source of all life, the connecting thread. If you read John M. Allegro's Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, he tells you that philologically and etymolo etymologically, which means the study of language, that Jesus and the names in the Bible and all the stories are words that literally translate into Zeus and ultimately go back to the name of the mushroom, the Amanita muscaria, the lightning bolt, which we are living, breathing, walking, talking representations of. We're like an external seed or a fruit body that's been cast out in a way. And we forget that we're connected to it all. That we are like it's active creating force. The the epitome, if you will, at the moment on the, the progress upwards of the refinement back towards a pure ethereal spiritual body where we're able to exist in the cosmos as stars, if you will. You know, the, the sun is not eternal, but it certainly last for a span of time that we would consider eternal. The universe, when truly understood, is eternal because it has no beginning or no end. It's just a coming around and going through itself again. <clears throat> These von Neumann probes, they go, they begin the process of evolutionary life creation. There's a program in the very most basic form of life that already has, just like a seed, its ultimate goal, the fruit. So the entire evolutionary process is nothing but a growth of the tree, a spreading of the branches, and a becoming of the purpose of the seed, which is to produce the fruit that has more seed inside of it. Okay. And the seed inside the fruit is consciousness, the self-awareness. That way we can reach out and find others and actually living, breathing, walking, talking representations of the mushroom, of the all, because all life is connected, is all one. Pan, God of nature, tells us this. Francis Bacon's the Wisdom of the Ancients reveals this beautifully. 
Now, as a shaman, I've taken these experiences to heart, and I, I've I've gone on these journeys, and I know what I know, and I know no 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 thing, <laughs> just like Socrates. It's a paradox. It's a riddle. It's a quandary. It's an enigma. It's a cipher that once understood well, allows you the keys to being the co-creator of your own reality but with those keys just like you know keys to a fancy new sports car come a great responsibility you can't use this knowledge for negative and expect it not to come back around in a negative fashion if not in this incarnation, if you will, but most certainly in the next. <laughs> uh, yes. So Annie Besant tells us that right thought is necessary to right conduct, right understanding to right living, and the divine wisdom, whether called by its ancient Sanskrit name of Brahma Vidya or its modern Greek name of Theosophia, Theosophy, comes to the world as it wants an adequate philosophy and an all-embracing religion and ethic. It was once said of the Christian scriptures by a devotee that they contained shallows in which a child could wade and depths in which a giant must swim. A similar statement might be made of theosophy, for some of its teachings are so simple and so practical that any person of average intelligence can understand and follow them, while others so lofty, so profound, that the ablest strains his intellect to constrain or to contain them and sinks exhausted in the effort. She goes on to tell us, It is admitted on all hands that a survey of the great religions of the world shows that they hold in common many religious, ethical, and philosophical ideas. But while the fact is universally granted, the explanation of the fact is a matter of dispute. Some allege the relig that religions have grown up uh, on the soil of human ignorance tilled by the imagination and have been gradually elaborated from crude forms of animism and fetchism. Their likenesses are referred to universal natural phenomenon and imperfectly observed and fanciful explained solar and star worship being the universal key for one school. Phallic worship the equally universal key for another. Fear, desire, ignorance, and wonder led the savage to personify the powers of nature and priests played upon his terror and his hopes, his, his misty fancies and his bewildered questionings. Myths became scriptures and symbols facts. And as their basis was universal, the likeness of the products was inevitable. Thus speak the, quote, doctors of comparative mythology. To which there is an alternative understanding and interpretation that, that the continual discounting and debasing of this knowledge as fanciful and mythical and, and what have you is, is narcissism, it's ego, and it's the issue that we have with the materialistic um, linear causality mode of the West, Western world today. But there's hope. It goes on. She says, They cannot deny the likeness, but they dimly feel. Are all men's dearest hopes and loftiest imaginings really nothing more than the outcome of savage fancies and groping ignorance? Have the great leaders of the race, the martyrs and heroes of humanity, lived, rot, and suffered, and died, and deluded for the mere personifications of astronomical facts and for the draped obscenities of barbarians? The second explanation of the common property in the religion of the world asserts the existence of an original teaching in the custody of a brotherhood of great spiritual teachers, who themselves, the outcome of past cycles of evolution, acted as the instructors and guides of the child humanity of our planet, imparting to its races and nations in turn the fundamental truths of religion in the form most adapted to the idiosyncrasies uh, of the recipients. According to this view, the founders of the great religions are members of the One Brotherhood and were aided in their missions by many other members, lower in degree than themselves, initiates and disciples of various grades, eminent in spiritual insight and philosophic knowledge or in purity of ethical wisdom. These guided the infant nations, gave them their polity, enacted their laws, ruled them as kings, taught them as philosophers, guided them as priests, all the nations of antiquity, looked back to such mighty men 
demigods and heroes, and they left their traces in literature and architecture and in legislation. That such men lived, it seems difficult to deny in the face of universal tradition of still existing scriptures and of prehistoric remains for the most part now in ruins to say nothing of other testimony which the ignorant would reject. The sacred books of the East are the best evidence for the greatness of their authors. For who in the later days or in modern times can even approach the spiritual sublimity of their religious thought, the intellectual splendor of their philosophy, and the breadth and purity of their ethic? And when we find that these books contain teachings about God, man, and the universe identical in substance under many variety of outer appearance, it does not seem unreasonable to refer to them to a central primary body of doctrine. To that body we give the name of the divine wisdom in its Greek form, theosophy. This brotherhood, this is who the fungi and the taking of the sacred entheogens allow the sages, the adepts, the philosophers, the heroes, the great men to communicate with. They access, they've been guiding evolution through the subconscious, through the all is mind, the ether, if you will. If you understand quantum mechanics, our brothers, our evolved brothers on the other planets and other solar systems and other places, they have the power to connect with all other life that has the same software, if you will, or, or hardware, um, and communicate and help guide that, that progress. They understand that it's a, it's a time that takes refinement, it takes transmutation, it takes effort. They understand that and they, they have patience because they understand that time is an illusion and that ultimately we will arrive at that location as well. I love you all, and we are all one. Just let the light touch you. Peace.